This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. If I stand up, can everyone see the images? Or I... Okay. Um, I would like to very much thank um, Alice and Sally for organising this conference and for having me over. Um, I'm very excited to speak about these objects today because I get to speak about them in a way that I haven't done before. I would also like you to imagine that this is much curlier and Victorian. I'm suffering from Mac transfer of light. <laughs> um, so 19th century Britain is famous for the quality of its mourning. Elaborate, intricate pictures <coughs> of mourning dress marked out the passage of loved ones and cast a black pall over the clothing and textiles surviving today. But what of the dead themselves? What did people wear to their eternal rest, the last garment they would ever be clothed in? This is the bonnet of a five-month-old London baby who died in the early 1840s. It is made from coarse white silk satin and once had black lace as decoration. You can just about see on the bottom there's a couple of marks that was the black lace overlay. When archaeologists opened the baby's coffin, they found that the small posy of yellow flowers it held in death was perfectly preserved. And when I catalogued the bonnet, I found pieces of mummified scalp adhering to the fabric. And the fleeting emotions you may just have felt in that description, a sort of curiosity, a poignancy, and disgust, really characterised my work on a group of excavated 19th century burial textiles from London. The analysis revealed other emotions invested in the textiles themselves, particularly pride or a sort of communal respectability, and the findings challenged established histories of Victorian burial practices. Um, I should say I don't always have images of the objects um, I discuss because of the way the photography was done for the publications that resulted from this, so um, you'll just have to imagine it. Since 1991, excavations across Britain in the fields of post-medieval post archaeology have been moving closer to the present day in sites <coughs> of late 18th to mid 19th century crypts and burial grounds. The last 10 years in particular have seen an increase in published sites and a corresponding growing body of analysis. While we are used to rare textile information obtained from early modern or medieval excavations, such as this cap, digging into the distance of the recent past is a new and comparatively underexplored source for historic textile research. The textiles I studied came from two separate excavation projects by the Museum of London Archaeology Service during 2004 until 2008 at four non-conformist or commercial burial grounds in London. A non-conformist is a member of a religious denomination that does not conform to the established church in England. They could be dissenting Protestants, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians or Independents, or Roman Catholics. The first site group included St. Michael's Roman Catholic Church Cemetery in Lucan Street, Shadwell, the Roman Catholic burial ground under the parish of St. Mary and St. Michael Commercial Road, now under the playground of Bishop Chaloner Primary School, and the burial ground of Bow Baptist Church in Payne Road, Tower Hamlets. The second site was a private commercial cemetery called New Bunhill Fields, found underneath the Future Globe Academy in Devil Street, Southwark. In use, each of the excavated burial grounds spans a comparatively short time period, covering severally 1816 to 1856, with most textiles dating from the period 1843 to 54 at St. Mary and St. Michael's. Private burial grounds owe their origins to the severe overcrowding of the London churchyards and parish burial grounds. The duty of burying the dead in parish church grounds lay with the Church in England, who struggled to keep up with the demands of mass urbanisation. So the great majority of burials in dissenting cemeteries were of people who were not subscribing members of the congregation to whom the ground belonged. However, during Charles Booth's late 19th century survey into London, he still noted that, quote, the Church of St. Mary and St. Michael Commercial Road is supported by its people, who are mostly poor Irish labourers. A few private individuals bought the larger dissenters grounds as money-making ventures. By 1835, there were at least 14 in London, and the charges for interments were generally lower than the churchyards. Usually, the owners aimed, aimed to make as much money as possible with a great temptation to pack the burials in and cut corners. This led to ghastly states of affairs, 
with, quote, heaped soil saturated and blackened with human remains and fragments of the dead. Graves in all cemeteries could be used a dozen times over a couple of years for stacked multiple burials. And you can see from the picture here the intensity of grave finds stacked up on top of each other. Uh, at Bishop Chaloner, for example, the deepest coffins were 3.9 metres below the contemporary ground surface, and the shallowest was only 60 centimetres down. These factors mean a number of things for the textile finds. The bodies were jumbled, piled, and usually unidentifiable in name. They were necessarily of a lower income. Religious orientation was uncertain unless a distinctly Catholic object was found, and the damp, juicy conditions were perfect for fibre decay. All was a wild and woolly jumble. The, the opposite of young George Davis here in his very nice, tidy, um, sealed, upper middle class, cotton clad burial. I analysed 84 separate groups of textiles from Tower Hamlets, the most found in the Catholic cemetery at Lincoln Street, <coughs> and 14 groups from New Bunhill Field, Southwark. Textiles formed a relatively small percentage of the finds when compared with hard coffin plates, accessories and personal adornment, and the number of skeletons recovered overall. The textiles are a new partial chance found source whose very newness meant it was hard to find contextual interpretive material. The unusual archaeological origin means historians have not yet used the findings more widely. Burying textiles causes specific kinds of deterioration and thus sample bias. Fine cellulosic textiles like linen and cotton de de bleh, deteriorate rapidly in damp conditions and are rarely found, mostly by adhesions to corroded metals like hooks or in tiny, tiny fragments of stitching threads. They are more common in uh, linen cotton, far more common in crypt burials. Some tougher vegetable spiders, like jute or hemp, can survive longer and were found in five objects. Consistent with materials recovered from burials of a similar date and context, the majority of finds are proteinaceous, 69% wool and 24% silk, and in four cases, human hair corroded into a pin. Penelope Walton Rogers' analysis of textiles from a 2001 churchyard excavation at St. Martin's in the Pool Ring in Birmingham provide the best comparison material. The textiles come out of the ground in clumps and fragments. Even after conservation cleaning, there was often dirt, plant matter, and human remains clinging to the pieces. Metal corroded layers of textiles into piles, conjoining disparate materials, often the only reason the textile survives. The piles could be teased apart into further fragments or left as a whole like a rather gruesome jigsaw puzzle. What goes where, if at all? Is there any sense to the clump? I ended up dividing clump textiles into those with seams and those without, and then started looking for ghosts of information, where the textiles weren't, the holes and the imprints they leave. The negative information could often be as revealing as the positive. Tiny shreds could be unfolded into imaginary garments on small clues, or had no distinguishing features and remained ambiguous. Other fragments show very clear evidence of being parts of a constructed garment, like this trouser front, which is you know, evidently a trouser fly front. Many scraps of woolen fabric were unidentifiable in purpose and could be coffin furnishings or winding shrouds. The most common textiles were crinkled, crinkled woolen or more often worsted uh, weft, which is the horizontal threads, from union cloths, which are made of two different fibres, that remain in shredded bunches after their linen or cotton warp, the vertical, has completely disintegrated. Where the union cloth survives on clothing, it is either the face fabric covering a coarser supporting wall or the main fabric itself. So what did the dead wear? Was it a shroud, uh, made either as a winding sheet from a length of fabric and pinned around them, or one of the decorated back opening smocks advertised in funeral wholesalers' catalogues? This is one from 1922, but they, they vary very, very little um, from the mid-19th century ones. Did they wear their own clothing? And who decided this, and what emotions did it represent to them? Information about lower class death and burial practices scant, although mortality in its rituals is one of the great 19th century narratives. Much has been written about mourning dress, very little about dressing the dead. I realise now this narrative also speaks of the middle and upper classes. The lower classes' histories are nearly silent. When with most of these textiles, the material investigation of the objects drove the histories which emerged. They led, 
I followed as best I could from extrapolating from the mute remains and finding little in documents. The textiles sometimes had no equivalent in published or collected dress history and demanded new questions and conjectures. There's a lot of questions coming up. <laughs> Job wrote that, quote, funeral <coughs> ritual provided an admirable medium through which families and individuals could demonstrate their place in society. The surviving textiles show an adherence to providing as decent a burial as possible. For example, I found a curious group from a male grave of 37 scraps of silk in various colours with pinked sort of zigzag and scalloped edges. Although this technique is used for rosettes and other coffin furnishings, as well for fashionable dress, these pieces are the offcuts with the scallop concave into the fabric and a raw opposite edge, they're scraps. So why were they in the grave? Perhaps the undertaker used them as stuffing for something that's now disintegrated like a pillow. Or if the quantity of silk frills in a coffin bespoke the inhabitant's status, it might be the poor man's way of adding a touch of costly fabric. I'm also not quite sure what clothing may be missing in this very haphazard sample. Shroud pins were found in 27 examples, but buttons were by far the largest group of, of finds associated with clothing. They were found with at least 64 skeletons in bone, shell, copper alloy, and glass. Some matched those used on surviving men's linen or cotton shirts and drawers. And one segment of woolen, woolen men's drawers is comparable with two museum examples dated 1837-49. They are clues to vanished garments. Were corpses dressed in contemporary underclothing, which is found in crypt burials, or in full suits that have now decayed? And if there were originally any of the elaborately decorated cotton shrouds, pillows, caps, and jaw bands found in middle class crypt burials, none remained. One pair of knitted stockings survived in part. The lack of more is another point of contrast with crypt burials, though it may be the result of site bias. Does burial in trousers preclude the need for stockings? Do stockings indicate a dress shirt, shroud, or a nightshirt burial, like George here? And why did a dead woman need a pair of very fine machine knitted gloves, once of fine soft wool? What did this represent to her or her attendants? Gloves provided by undertakers were common for mourners. Does this suggest the dead could also be dressed in mourning clothing? Certainly, many dark dyed wools emerged from the ground. Are the bodies that are fully dressed for burial in mourning clothes, their best clothes, or a suit they could spare? And who made that decision? No dye analysis was done, and it would be interesting to see how the dyes related to, the ex to extant mourning clothing, and if they show evidence of the recorded practice of over dyeing colours with a very cheap black dye. Silk crepe, which is the ubiquitous 19th century mourning fabric, does not appear at all, which may be sample bias, it may reflect the socio-economic conditions, or it may be represented by the scraps of presumably cheaper black wool crepe. And how do these poor Londoners' burial choices fit with the goods provided by a growing number of funeral <coughs> supply warehouses at the time? Comparisons with the Birmingham finds reveal interesting parallels. The baby's bonnet fabric and ribbon are woven with a 5-1 satin, which is really quite coarse for this period. Walton Rogers found white silk satin of exactly the same quality, suggesting it was a standard, cheaper make supplied by undertakers and funeral furnishers. She also found the same high quantity of union cloth remains, suggesting its popularity. This cloth could be Parramatta or Bombazette, both recorded as union cloths at the cheaper end of the morning cloth spectrum, in contrast with crepe and bombazine. But morning cloths were universally black. The union cloth fragments were not. Minute specks of linen remaining in the crinkly wefts were undyed white. Parramatta was originally woven white then dyed to shade. When compared to the definite blacks of other excavated textiles, this all points to a high number of bodies buried in an undyed, cream-coloured wool and linen cloth. It was probably cheaper. And yet, I also found a high quality silk stock, which is a, sort of a neck piece. Many decorative black or once white silk ribbons survived, still tied in a bow, clinging to the pins with which they adorned a coffin or held, or to hold a personal memento, such as a pendant or a rosary or a lock of hair. To whom is the respect being demonstrated by these expenses? To the dead or to the community that views the dead? Or both, conflating respect and respectability? 
Another silk find is an imitation sacred heart pendant. That's about this big, cut from ribbon and then stuffed and then sewn with buttonhole stitch. It's a textile belief token for the afterlife, which has indeed proclaimed someone's faith when everything else is lost. Does religious feeling consistently affect te burial textile practices? And how much is that mediated by income or availability of appropriate consumer items? I expected two kinds of burial garments. The deceased's own normal clothing and shrouds or other grave clothing. An exciting discovery was a third type, which I termed burial clothing. Hastily, hastily and coarsely made simulations of current fashion. I've never come across this before. Um, really quite exciting. Signs such as pad stitching under a collar and stitch holes that are about you know, one to two millimetres apart in the textiles mean normal clothing, which is made carefully for everyday wear in life. Um, however, I found a woolen waistcoat shape made with stitches three to five millimetres long, which is just like shrouds. Larger stitches mean quicker and thus cheaper construction in the pre-sewing machine age. The waistcoat had working buttons, shrouds had false decorative buttons. The waistcoat opens at the front as usual, shrouds open at the back to provide a smooth false front. Another piece of a boy's suit and some fragments shown here display the same clothing quality wool with crude construction traces. This could be a quality of cheap clothing available to East End inhabitants that hasn't survived in collections, but discussion with an American researcher revealed that similar hastily made clothing has been found in a mid-19th century Catholic burial in Louisiana. The tradition, especially amongst the Irish, of waking the body, ha having a wake, by displaying it dressed in the coffin for one to three days after death, um, is related to the burial clothing, a practice seen here in a very rare post-mortem photo. Here we get into the interesting realm of social emo emotions versus practicality. Clearly the body needs to present a decent appearance to the mourners. It could have been a better bargain to get a burial suit made than to inter the deceased in their own clothing if other family members could still wear it. Or was having a new suit important to family dignity if it could be afforded? Why not then use a ready-made shroud with its non-clothing shape? Is this a generally Roman Catholic or specifically Irish practice? And then what about those bodies buried in their real clothing, including the feminine button found with a scrap of luxurious silk velvet suggesting Sunday best? I sort of feel, you know, insert lots more research here. And with most of these textiles, the, material, the emotional aspect is indivisible from their materiality. These are partial finds because a human being's body decayed in them. I found complicated emotional responses arising when faced with a fragment of finger bone in a glove. And what do I do with the way that these pieces leave me feeling? Where is the place for the poetics of tenderness, the poignancy, the revulsion, the curiosity, the black humour, besides my private contemplation? That textiles evoke personal connections with family deaths and a horrible fascination. At times, the research took over, and I was holding the textiles centimetres from my face, oblivious to their origins and my squeamishness, in the quest to know more of their present. You know, who was I breathing in when I forgot my dust mask? <coughs> Anybody who works with objects, um, um, we had a, sort of touched on this in a discussion in yesterday afternoon's panel, you, you get a sort of a fondness and a soft spot that develop for objects character, um, the tender sadness of the, the baby's bonnet and the loving care with which it was buried gave me a really sort of heartful resonance beyond that of a normal baby's bonnet in a collection. Um, I do feel as a group though that the grave textiles are sort of stubborn and a bit bolshy. You know, they, they give information away grudgingly and they're certainly unlovely falling outside aesthetic fashion histories. Studying these and writing as I did for an archaeological report gives even less room than an article for addressing emotions. It requires a reasonable neutrality and an objective discussion of the objects. All the personal responses are stripped. The baby's bonnet, for example, made groups of curators, conservators and archaeologists all go basically, oh, <laughs> but that's an indelible part of my research experience and, and the experience of identification that has little place, no place in the final impersonal report. Could the emotional quotient be an integral part of future humanities publications 
if we move away from the science originating models we, we have at the moment, will emotions remain <coughs> the preserve of popular writing? How do we tabulate the human response in the humanities? I find it fascinating that all that remains of a poor, unknown descending Londoner is their bones and clumps of humble, random textiles. When their flesh has gone the way of all flesh and even their names are lost, the care someone extended to their soul departed body remains. Analyzing these was touching the scraps of care <coughs> and emotion invested in burying a person. Here is the last tucking in you ever get. Does a profit seeking impersonal undertaker dress you, or is it done in the bosom of your family to the best standards <coughs> to afford to do you and them respect? Who decides what is seemly in death, how much it reflects what clothing is most seemly in life, and who is the seemliness for, the departed or the bereaved? I like the way what I find in the pieces eludes the documentary. It slips into a silence that is eloquent if you can read its messages. I like the presence of absence, the holes left by stitches, the impressions and corrosions and challenges of unpacking incomplete, incoherent remains and identities. The awful tender intimacy of decayed clothing becomes one with the body in a fused, literal, fleshly identification. All they are is textile and bone. Is there order in fact my business? And do these textiles, this person, have a right to their last privacy or is this their accidental memorialization? So I'm left with more questions than perhaps I've answered. And I feel that the questions these objects raise are the immaterial warp in their very material gaps. And I look forward to future excavations and archival research that begins to create an intersecting weft of knowledge that establishes more of these underrepresented London silent histories. Um, and if you would like to read more about the technicalities of you know, Walking Weft and Under and Over, these are the reports. Um, they are much, much drier. <laughs>